Book Five, Chapters Thirty Eight to Fifty Eight of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book Five, Chapter Thirty Eight. Ambiorix was in high glee at his victory. Bidding his infantry follow him, he started at once with his cavalry for the country of the Aduatusi, who were conterminous with his kingdom, and pushed on throughout the night and the next day. Having related what had happened and roused the Aduatusi, he reached the country of the Nervii next day, and urged them not to lose the chance of establishing their independence for good and taking vengeance upon the Romans for the wrongs which they had suffered. Two generals, he told them, were killed, and a great part of the army had perished. There would be no difficulty in surprising the legion that was wintering under Cicero and destroying it. He promised to help in the attack, and the Nervii were readily persuaded by his words. 39. Accordingly they at once sent off messengers to the Seutrines, Grudaei, Levasi, Pleumoxai, and the Jidumni all of whom are under their sway, raising as large a force as they could, and swooped down unexpectedly on Cicero's camp before the news of Titanus's death reached him. In his case, too, the inevitable result was that some soldiers who had gone off into the forests to fetch wood for fortification were cut off by the sudden arrival of the cavalry and surrounded, and the Eburones, Nervii, and Aduatusi, accompanied by all their allies and dependents, attacked the legion in great force. Our men flew to arms and mounted the rampart. They could barely hold out that day, for the enemy staked all their hopes upon swift action, and they were confident that if they were victorious on this occasion, their victory would be lasting. 40. Cicero instantly sent dispatches to Caesar, offering large rewards to the messengers if they succeeded in delivering them, but all the roads were blocked, and the messengers were intercepted. In the night as many as one hundred and twenty towers were run up with incredible speed out of the timber which the men had collected for fortification, and the defects in the works were made good. Next day the enemy, who had been largely reinforced, renewed their attack on the camp, and filled up the trench. Our men resisted in the same way as the day before, and day after day the course of events was the same. Work went on without a break throughout the night. Neither the sick nor the wounded could get a chance of rest. Everything necessary for repelling the next day's attack was got ready in the night. Numerous stakes, burnt and hardened at the ends, and a large number of heavy pikes were prepared. The towers were furnished with platforms, and embattled breastworks of wattlework were fastened to them. Cicero himself, though he was in very poor health, would not allow himself to rest even in the night time so that the soldiers actually thronged round him and by their remonstrances constrained him to spare himself. Footnote. These pikes were hurled down from the towers. End footnote. 41. And now the commanders and chieftains of the Nervii, who had some claim to address Cicero and were on friendly terms with him, expressed the wish to have an interview. Their request being granted, they repeated the same tale that Ambiorix had told in dealing with Titurius. The whole of Gaul was in arms, the Germans had crossed the Rhine, Caesar's camp and the camps of the other officers were beleaguered. They also mentioned the death of Sabinus, and pointed to Ambiorix to gain credit for their story. The Romans, they said, were mistaken if they expected any help from men who themselves were desperate. However, they had no quarrel with Cicero and the Roman people except that they objected to winter camps and did not want the custom to become established. They might leave their camp in safety, as far as they were concerned, and go wherever they liked, without fear. To these arguments Cicero simply replied that it was not the habit of the Roman people to accept terms from an armed enemy. If the Gauls would lay down their arms, they could send envoys to Caesar and avail themselves of his intercession. Caesar was just and he hoped that they would obtain what they asked. 42. After this rebuff the Nervii invested the camp with a rampart ten feet high and a trench fifteen feet wide. 
they had learned the secret from observing our methods in former years, and they also got hints from prisoners whom they had taken, belonging to our army. But, as they had no supply of iron tools suitable for the purpose, they were obliged to cut the sods with their swords, and take up the earth with their hands and in their cloaks. From this one could form an estimate of their vast numbers, for in less than three hours they completed a contravallation three miles in extent, and during the next few days they proceeded, after due preparation, to construct towers proportioned to the height of the Roman rampart, grappling hooks, and sappers' huts, which the prisoners had also taught them how to make. 43. On the seventh day of the siege a great gale sprang up, and the besiegers began to sling red-hot bullets made of plastic clay and to throw burning darts at the huts, which, in the Gallic fashion, were thatched. The huts quickly took fire, and, owing to the force of the wind, the flames spread all over the camp. The enemy cheered loudly, as if victory were already certain, and began to move forward their towers and huts and to escalade the rampart. But so great was the courage of the legionnaires, and such was their presence of mind, that, although they were everywhere scorched by the flames and harassed by a hail of missiles, and knew that all their baggage and everything that belonged to them was on fire, not only did none of them abandon his post on the rampart, but hardly a man even looked round, and in that hour all fought with the utmost dash and resolution. This was far the most trying day for our men, but nevertheless the result was that a very large number of the enemy were killed or wounded for they had crowded right under the rampart, and the rear ranks would not allow those in front to fall back. The fire abating a little, a tower was pushed up at one point and brought into contact with the rampart, when the centurions of the third cohort stepped back from the spot where they were standing, withdrew all their men, and began to challenge the enemy, by voice and gesture, to come on if they liked. But not one of them dared to advance. Then they were sent flying by showers of stones from every side, and the tower was set on fire. 44. In this legion there were two centurions, Titus Polo and Lucius Vorinus, who, by dint of extraordinary courage, were getting close to the first grade. They were forever disputing as to which was the better man, and every year they contended for promotion with the greatest acrimony. When the fighting at the entrenchment was at its hottest, Varinus, cried Polo, why hesitate? What better chance can you want of proving your courage? This day shall settle our disputes. With these words he walked outside the entrenchment, and where the enemy's ranks were thickest dashed in. Varinus, of course, did not keep inside the rampart. Afraid of what everyone would think, he followed his rival. At a moderate distance, Polo threw his javelin at the enemy and struck one of them as he was charging out of the throng. He fainted from the blow, and the enemy protected him with their shields, and all together hurled their missiles at his assailant and cut off his retreat. Pullo's shield was transfixed, and the dart stuck in his sword belt. The blow knocked his scabbard round, so that his hand was hampered as he tried to draw his sword, and in his helpless state the enemy thronged round him. His rival, Varinus, ran to his rescue, and helped him in his stress. In a moment the whole multitude left Pullo, believing that the dart had killed him, and turned upon Vorinus. Sword in hand, Vorinus fought at bay, killed one of his assailants, and forced the rest a little way back. But pressing on too eagerly, he ran headlong down a slope and fell. He was in his turn surrounded, but Pullo succored him, and the two men slew several of the enemy and got back, safe and sound and covered with glory, into the entrenchment. Thus fortune made them her puppets in rivalry and combat, rival helping rival and each saving the other, so that it was impossible to decide which was to be deemed the braver man. 45. Day by day the perils and the hardships of the siege increased, for this reason above all, that, many of the soldiers being enfeebled by wounds, few were now available for defense and day by day messengers were sent off with dispatches to Caesar in more and more rapid succession. Some of them were caught and tortured to death in sight of our soldiers. There was a solitary Nervian in the camp, named Vershico, a man of good birth, who at the beginning of the siege had taken refuge with Cicero, and had done him loyal service. This man induced his slave, 
by the hope of freedom and by large rewards, to take a dispatch to Caesar. The slave carried the dispatch tied to a javelin, and, being a Gaul himself, went among the Gauls without exciting any suspicion, and made his way to Caesar, who learned from him the perils that encompassed Cicero and the legion. 46. Caesar received the dispatch about the eleventh hour. He at once sent a messenger into the country of the Pelovisi, to Marcus Crassus, the quaestor, whose camp was twenty-five miles off, ordering his legion to march at midnight and join him speedily. Crassus left on receiving the message. Caesar sent another messenger to Gaius Fabius, bidding him march his legion into the country of the Atrebates, through which he knew that he would himself have to go, and wrote to Labienus, directing him, if he could do so consistently with the public interest, to move with his legion to the country of the Nervii. As the rest of the army was rather too far off, he did not think it wise to wait for it. But he got together about four hundred horsemen from the nearest camps. 47. About the third hour he learned from the scouting parties of Crassus's advanced guard that he was coming, and on the same day marched twenty miles. He left Crassus in command at Samarobrava, and assigned him a legion. As he was leaving behind the heavy baggage of the army, the hostages of the various tribes, the state papers, and the whole of the grain which he had brought there to last the winter. Fabius obeyed orders, and, without any serious delay, joined Caesar on the march with his legion. Labienus was aware of the fate of Sabinus and the massacre of his cohorts. The whole host of the Treveri was upon him, and he was afraid that, if he quitted his camp like a runaway, he would not be able to sustain the enemy's attack, especially as he knew that they were elated by their recent success. Accordingly he sent a dispatch to Caesar, telling him that it would be very dangerous for him to withdraw his legion from its quarters, describing what had happened in the country of the Eburones, and explaining that the whole host of the Treveri, horse and foot, had taken up a position three miles from his camp. 48. Caesar approved his decision and although he had only two legions instead of three which he had expected, he saw that success was just possible with speed. By forced marches he advanced into the Nervian territory, where, learning from prisoners what was going on at Cicero's camp, and realizing the extreme peril of his position, he induced one of his Gallic horsemen by large rewards to carry a letter to him. He wrote it in Greek characters, for fear it might be intercepted and his plans become known to the enemy and advised the man, if he could not get into the camp, to tie the letter to the thong of a javelin and throw it inside the entrenchment. He said that he had started with his legions and would soon arrive, and exhorted Cicero to be true to himself. The Gaul, dreading the risk of detection, threw his javelin, as he had been directed. It chanced to lodge in a tower and was not noticed by our men for two days. But on the third day a soldier observed it, took it down, and brought it to Cicero. After perusing the letter, he paraded the troops and read it aloud, to their intense delight. And now the smoke of distant fires was seen, and all doubt about the coming of the legions was dispelled. 49. The Gauls, on hearing the news from their patrols, raised the siege, and marched with all their forces, about sixty thousand fighting men, to encounter Caesar. Cicero, availing himself of the opportunity, asked Vershico, the same man whom we have mentioned above, to let him again employ his Gallic slave to carry a dispatch to Caesar, and, warning the man to move circumspectly and warily, wrote to say that the enemy had left and gone with their whole host to intercept him. About midnight the letter was delivered to Caesar, who informed his troops of its contents, and thus nerved them for the struggle. Next day he broke up his camp at daybreak, and, after advancing about four miles, described the enemy in force beyond a broad valley in a rivulet. It would have been very hazardous with such a slender force to fight on unfavorable ground. Besides, knowing that Cicero was released from blockade, he felt that he might without anxiety take his own time. Accordingly he remained where he was, and encamped on the most advantageous site he could find. The area was naturally small, as there was barely seven thousand men, and, moreover, no heavy baggage. But he reduced it as much as possible by narrowing the passages, with the deliberate intention of making the enemy despise him. 
Meanwhile, he sent out scouts in all directions to find out the most convenient place for crossing the valley. 50. Cavalry skirmishes took place that day by the waterside, but the two armies maintained their respective positions, the Gauls waiting for reinforcements, which had not yet come up, while Caesar hoped that he might perhaps succeed, by feigning fear, in enticing the enemy over to his position, and thus be able to fight on the near side of the valley, in front of his camp, or, failing that, might reconnoiter the roads and so cross valley and rivulet with less risk. At daybreak the enemy's horse came close up to the camp and engaged ours. Caesar deliberately ordered his cavalry to give way and fall back into the camp, at the same time directing the troops to increase the height of the rampart on all sides and block up the gateways, and in doing so to move about as hurriedly as possible and do their work with a pretense of fear. 51. Lured on by all these devices, the enemy crossed over and formed up on unfavorable ground, and as our men were actually withdrawn from the rampart, they ventured nearer, and threw missiles from all sides into the entrenchment, sending round criers with orders to announce that if anyone, Gaul or Roman, cared to come over and join them before the third hour, he might safely do so, but that after that time the permission would be withdrawn. The gates were blocked but merely for show, with a single row of sods, and, fancying that they could not break through that way, some of them, in their contempt for our men, began to demolish the rampart with their bare hands, and others to fill up the ditches. Then, while the infantry rushed out from all the gates, Caesar let loose the cavalry and quickly sent the enemy flying, not a man standing to strike one blow. Many were slain, and all had to drop their arms. 52. Caesar was afraid to continue the pursuit, because there were woods and marshes in the way, and he could see no chance of inflicting the smallest loss upon the fugitives. But he reached Cicero on the same day without the loss of a man. He surveyed with admiration the towers which the enemy had erected, their sappers' huts, and earthworks. When the legion was paraded, he found that not one man in ten had got off unwounded and from all these things he appreciated the danger and the resolution with which the defense had been conducted. Warmly commending Cicero for his services, and also the legion, he addressed individually the centurions and tribunes, who, as he learned from Cicero's report, had shown distinguished gallantry. Having obtained correct information from prisoners about the fate of Sabinus and Cotta, he paraded the legion next day, described what had happened, and cheered and reassured the men. The culpable rashness of a general officer had entailed a disaster, but they must take it calmly, for the blessing of the immortal gods and their own valor had repaired the loss, and the enemy had as little cause for lasting exultation as they had for inordinate grief. 53. Meanwhile the news of Caesar's victory was brought by Romans to Labienus with incredible rapidity. He was sixty miles from Cicero's camp, and it was past the ninth hour when Caesar arrived there. Yet before midnight a shout arose at the gates of his camp, announcing a victory and conveying the congratulations of the Remi. When the news reached the Treviri, Indushomerus, who had determined to attack Labienus's camp on the following day, made off in the night and withdrew his whole force into their country. Caesar sent back Fabius and his legion to camp, intending to winter himself with three legions in three separate camps near Samarobrava, and, as such serious disturbances had broken out in Gaul, he determined to remain with the army the whole winter. When the news of Sabinus's calamitous death spread abroad, almost all the tribes of Gaul began to form warlike projects, sending messages and embassies in all directions, trying to ascertain each other's plans and see who would take the initiative, and holding meetings by night in lonely places. Caesar indeed had hardly any respite all through the winter from the harassing expectation of hearing news about the schemes and outbreaks on the part of the Gauls. Among the reports which reached him was one from Lucius Rossius, whom he had placed in command of the 13th legion, announcing that large numbers of Gauls had assembled from the Armorican tribes, as they are called, to attack him, and had been within eight miles of his camp, but that, on receiving the announcement of Caesar's victory, they had made off like runaways. Footnote. The maritime tribes between the Seine and the Loire. End footnote. 54. 
Caesar summoned the leading men of each tribe to his presence, frightened some by letting them know that he was aware of what was going on, encouraged others, and thus managed to keep a large part of Gaul obedient. The government of the Sinones, however, an extremely powerful tribe, who have great influence among the Gauls, attempted to put to death Caverinus, whom Caesar had set over them as king, and whose brother, Muratascus, had held sovereignty when Caesar came to Gaul, and his ancestors before him. Caverinus, anticipating their design, had fled. They pursued him as far as the frontier, dethroned and banished him, and then sent envoys to Caesar to explain. He ordered the whole council to appear before him, but they refused to obey. The mere fact that leaders had been found to strike the first blow had so much weight with the ignorant natives, and wrought such a complete change in temper of all, that, except the Edai and the Remi, whom Caesar always treated with special distinction, the former in consideration of their long-standing and steady loyalty to the Roman people, the latter for their recent services in the war, there was hardly a single tribe that we did not suspect. And indeed I am inclined to think that their conduct was quite natural, for this reason among many others. The Gauls were once the most warlike of all peoples, and it was most bitterly mortifying to them to have so completely lost that reputation as to be forced to submit to the domination of the Roman people. 55. All through the winter, without intermission, the Treveri and Indushomerus continued sending envoys across the Rhine, making overtures to tribes, promising them money, and assuring them that the greater part of our army had been destroyed and that the remnant was insignificant. Not a single German tribe, however, could be induced to cross the Rhine. They said that they had tried twice, in the war with Ariovistus and the migration of the Tenctory, and would not tempt fortune any more. Notwithstanding this disappointment, Indushomerus proceeded to raise his forces and drill them, to procure horses from the neighboring peoples, and by large rewards to induce exiles and condemned criminals from the whole of Gaul to join him. Indeed, he had now acquired such prestige in the country by these measures that embassies poured in from all quarters, soliciting his countenance and alliance both privately and with the authority of their respective governments. 56. Finding that advances were being spontaneously made to him, that on one side there were the Senones and Carnutes, stimulated by consciousness of guilt, on the other the Nervii and the Duatusi, preparing to attack the Romans, and that once he made a forward movement outside his frontier, he would have no lack of volunteers, he gave notice of a muster in arms. This, by Gallic usage, is tantamount to a declaration of war. By intertribal law all adult males are obliged to attend the muster under arms, and the last comer is tortured to death in sight of the host. At this gathering Indushomerus passed judgment upon Singeterex, the leader of the rival party, his own son-in-law, who, as we have already observed, had thrown in his lot with Caesar and had not failed him, declaring him a public enemy, and confiscated his property. After this step, he announced before the assembled house that he had been invited by the Senones, the Carnutes, and several other tribes to join them, and intended to march through the territory of the Remi, ravaging their lands, but first of all to attack the camp of Labienus. He then gave the necessary orders. 57. Labienus, who was ensconced in a strongly fortified camp of great natural strength, felt no anxiety for himself or his legion. His only care was not to lose any chance of striking a decisive blow. Accordingly, having ascertained from Singeterex and his relations the drift of Indushomerus's speech at the gathering, he sent messengers to the neighboring tribes and summoned cavalry from all sides, naming a date for their arrival. Meanwhile, Indushomerus rode up and down almost every day close under the rampart of the camp, sometimes to examine the position sometimes to converse with or intimidate the soldiers, while all his troopers generally threw missiles inside the rampart. Labienus steadily kept his men within the entrenchment, and did everything in his power to foster the belief that he was cowed. 58. Day after day Indushomerus moved up to the camp with growing contempt. Labienus made the cavalry, which he had summoned from all the neighboring tribes, enter the entrenchment in a single night 
and was so careful to keep all his troops inside under guard that it was quite impossible for their arrival to be made public or reach the knowledge of the Treviri. Meanwhile Indushomerus, according to his daily custom, came up to the camp and spent a great part of the day there, his troopers throwing missiles and challenging our men in the most insulting terms to fight. The men made no reply, and towards evening, thinking it time to be off, they broke up and dispersed. Suddenly Labienus sent out all his cavalry through two gates, giving stringent orders that when the enemy were panic-stricken and routed, as he rightly foresaw would happen, all ranks were to look out for Indushomerus, and not a man strike a blow till he saw Indushomerus killed, for he resolved that he should not gain time to escape by delay with the rest. He set a heavy price on his head, and sent a number of cohorts to support the cavalry. Fortune justified the general's plans. With every man on his track, Indushomerus was caught and killed in the act of fording a river, and his head brought back to camp. The cavalry on their way back pursued and killed all they could. On learning what had happened, the forces of the Eberonus and the Nervii which had assembled all went off, and thenceforward Caesar found Gaul somewhat more peaceable. End of chapter 58book six chapters one through eight of commentaries on the gallic war this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. commentaries on the gallic war by julius caesar translated by thomas rice holmes book six chapters one through eight book six Continued disturbances in northeastern Gaul, Caesar's second passage of the Rhine, manners and customs, religion and institutions of the Gauls and Germans, ill omened Aduatuca, extermination of the Eburones. Anticipating, for many reasons, increased disturbances in Gaul, Caesar determined to employ his lieutenants, Marcus Silanus, Gaius Antistius Reginus, and Titus Sextius in raising troops. At the same time he requested Nius Pompeius, then proconsul, who, though vested with the command of an army, remained on public grounds in the neighborhood of the capital, to order the recruits from Cisalpine Gaul, whom he had sworn in, when consul, to join their standards and repair to his quarters. For, looking to the future as well as the present, he thought it essential, with a view to impressing public opinion in Gaul, that the resources of Italy should appear sufficient not only to repair speedily any disaster in the field, but actually to increase the original army. Pompeius acceded to this request. From motives of patriotism as well as of friendship, the levy was speedily completed by Caesar's officers, and thus, before the close of winter, three legions were organized and mobilized, making double the number of the cohorts lost under Quintus Titorius. By this swift display of armed force he showed what could be effected by the organization and resources of the Roman people. After the death of Indutio Maros, already described, his command was transferred by the Treveri to his relations, who tried persistently to gain the support of the neighboring German peoples by promises of money. Failing to obtain a favorable answer from his neighbors, they made overtures to the more distant tribes and found some compliance. The parties mutually confirmed the alliance by oath, and hostages were given as security for the money. At the same time, the Treveri made a formal alliance with Ambiorix. On learning this, Caesar felt it necessary to take the field at once, for he saw that warlike preparations were afoot on all sides. The Nervii, the Aduatuci, and the Menapii, combined with all the Kisrenine Germans, were in arms. The Senones refused to attend at his bidding and were in communication with the Carnutes and the neighboring peoples, while the Treveri were sending embassies in rapid succession to solicit the aid of the Germans. Accordingly, before winter was over, Caesar assembled the four nearest legions, made an unexpected raid into the country of the Nervii, and, before they could either concentrate or flee, captured a large number of cattle and also of men, handed over this booty to the troops, ravaged the country, and compelled the Nervii to surrender and give hostages. 
This affair, rapidly disposed of, he withdrew the legions once more into winter quarters. In the early spring he convened a Gallic council, as usual. All of the delegates, except the Senones, Carnutes, and Treveri, attended, and, regarding their absence as the first step in rebellion, he determined to mark his sense of its paramount importance, and accordingly transferred the council to Lutitia, a town belonging to the Parisii. The Parisii were contuminous with the Senones, and the two had, within recent times, formed one state. But on this occasion the Parisii were believed to have disassociated themselves with the Senones. After announcing the adjournment from the front of the tribunal in his camp, Caesar started on the same day with his legions for the country of the Senones, and made his way thither by forced marches. Acco, the ringleader of the conspiracy, on learning his approach, directed the populace to assemble in the forts. They endeavored to obey, but before they could do so the arrival of the Romans was announced. Compelled to abandon their intention, they sent envoys to entreat Caesar's forbearance, who were introduced by the Aedui, under whose protection their tribe had been from time immemorial. At the request of the Aedui, Caesar readily pardoned them and accepted their excuses, feeling that the summer time should be devoted to the impending war, not to investigation. He ordered them, however, to find a hundred hostages, whom he handed over to the custody of the Aedui. The Carnutes likewise sent envoys and hostages to Caesar's quarters, availing themselves of the intercession of the Remi, whose dependents they were, and received the same answer. Caesar then finished the business of the council, and directed the tribes to furnish cavalry. Having tranquilized this part of Gaul, he devoted himself, heart and soul, to the campaign against the Treveri and Ambiorix. He directed Cavarinus to take the cavalry of the Senones and accompany him, for fear any disturbance should arise among the tribe from his resentment, or from the odium which he had brought upon himself. Upon making these arrangements, he endeavored to fathom Ambiorix's intentions, for he regarded it as certain that he did not intend to fight. Close to the country of the Eberones, and protected by continuous marshes and forests, were the Menapii, the only people in Gaul who had never sent envoys to Caesar to sue for peace. He knew that they were on friendly terms with Ambiorix, and he had ascertained that they had also, through the medium of the Treveri, come to an understanding with the Germans. His idea was to deprive Ambiorix of the support of these tribes before attacking him, lest, in despair, he should take refuge in the country of the Menapii, or be driven to join the peoples beyond the Rhine. Having decided upon this plan, he sent the heavy baggage of the whole army into the country of the Treveri to Labienus, and ordered two legions to join him, while he started in person with five legions in light marching order for the country of the Menapii. They had not assembled any force, but, relying upon the strength of their country, took refuge in the forests and marshes and transferred their belongings thither. Caesar placed Gaius Fabius and the quaestor Marcus Crassus in command of the divisions, and rapidly constructing causeways advanced with the three columns, burned homesteads and hamlets, and captured a large number of cattle and also of men. Yielding to this pressure, the Menapii sent envoys to him to sue for peace. He took hostages from them, and warned them that he would treat them as enemies if they admitted either Ambiorix or his agents within their territories. After settling these affairs, he left the Atrebatian Comius with a body of cavalry as a warden among the Menapii, and marched in person for the country of the Treveri. While Caesar was engaged in these operations, the Treveri, who had assembled a large force of infantry and cavalry, were preparing to attack Labienus and the single legion which was wintering in their country. They were within two days' march of his position, when they learned that the two legions dispatched by Caesar had arrived. Encamping fifteen miles off, they determined to wait for reinforcements from the Germans. Labienus ascertained their attention, and, hoping that their rashness would give him an opportunity for bringing them to action, left five cohorts to guard his baggage marched against the enemy with twenty-five cohorts and a large body of cavalry, and encamped within a mile of them. Between him and the enemy there was a river with steep banks which was difficult to cross. He had no intention of crossing it himself, and did not think it likely that the enemy would do so. 
their prospects of attaining reinforcements were daily improving. Labienus remarked openly in a council of war that, as the Germans were said to be approaching, he would not risk his own reputation and the safety of his army, but would strike his camp next morning at dawn. His words rapidly reached the enemy, for, out of a large body of Gallic cavalry, it was naturally inevitable that some should sympathize with the Gallic cause. In the night, Labienus called together the tribunes and chief centurions, explained his plans, and, with the view of making the enemy believe that he was afraid of them, ordered the camp to be struck with more noise and bustle than is customary with Romans. By this means, he contrived that his departure should resemble a flight. This was also reported to the enemy by their patrols before daybreak, for the two camps were very close together. The rear guard had barely got outside the entrenchment when the Gauls told each other not to let the hoped-for prize slip from their grasp. It would be a waste of time to wait for German aid when the Romans were panic-stricken, and it was humiliating, with their large host, to shrink from attacking a handful of men, especially as they were running away and hampered by their baggage. With this encouragement, they did not hesitate to cross the river and force on an action on unfavorable ground. Labienus had divined that this would happen, and hoping to lure them all across the stream, he kept quietly moving on, feigning, as before, that he was marching away. Then, sending on the baggage a little way, and parking it on a knoll. Soldiers, he said, you have got your chance. You have the enemy in your grasp. He is in a bad position, where he is not free to act. Show the same courage under my command that you have shown many times under the chief. Imagine that he is here, watching what is going on. With these words, he ordered the column to wheel into line of battle and advance, and sending a few troops of horse to protect the baggage, posted the rest on the flanks. The men raised a cheer, and swiftly launched their javelins against the enemy. Seeing the fancied runaways unexpectedly advancing to attack them, they could not even sustain their charge, but the moment they closed, fled precipitately to the nearest woods. Labienus hunted them down with his cavalry, killed a large number, took numerous prisoners, and a few days afterwards received the submission of the tribe. For the Germans, who were on their way to reinforce the Treveri, hearing of their rout, went back home. The relations of Indutio Maros, who had started the revolt, followed in their train and fled the country. The chief authority was transferred to Singetorix, who, as we have explained, had from the outset remained steadily loyal. End of Book 6, Chapters 1 through 8. Book 6, Chapters 9 through 28 of Commentaries on the Gallic War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Commentaries on the Gallic War by Julius Caesar. Translated by Thomas Rice Holmes. Book 6, chapters 9 through 28. After his march from the country of the Menapii to that of the Treveri, Caesar determined to cross the Rhine for two reasons. First, because the Germans had sent the Treveri reinforcements to act against him, and secondly, to prevent Ambiorix from finding an asylum in their country. Accordingly, he proceeded to construct a bridge, a little above the spot where he had crossed before. The principle of construction was perfectly familiar, and by great energy on the part of the men, the work was completed in a few days. Leaving a strong guard by the bridge in the country of the Treveri, to prevent any sudden outbreak on their part, he transported the remaining forces, including the cavalry, across the river. The Ubii, who had previously given hostages and submitted, wishing to clear themselves, sent envoys to him to explain that no reinforcements had been sent from their country into that of the Treveri, and that they earnestly begged him to spare them, and not to make the innocent suffer for the guilty, through indiscriminate animosity against the Germans, promising to give more hostages if he required them. On making inquiry, he found that the reinforcements had been sent by the Swabi. Accordingly, he accepted the explanations of the Ubii, and asked for particulars about the routes leading into the country of the Swabi. A few days later he was informed by the Ubii that the Swabi were all concentrating their forces and warning the tribes under their sway to send their contingents of horse and foot. 
On receiving this information, he arranged for a supply of grain and selected a suitable spot for a camp. At the same time, he directed the Ubii to withdraw their flocks and herds and transfer all their belongings from the open country into their strongholds, hoping that the ignorant barbarians might be tempted by want of food to fight a battle in unfavorable conditions. And he instructed them to send numerous scouts into the country of the Swabi, and to ascertain what they were about. The Ubii fulfilled their instructions, and, after the lapse of a few days, reported that all the Swabi, on the arrival of messengers with trustworthy information about the Roman army, had retreated with all their forces, and those which they had raised from their allies, to the furthest extremity of their country, where there was an immense forest called Bacanus, stretching far into the heart of the continent, and, like a natural wall, protecting the Cherusci from the raids of the Swabi, and the Swabi from those of the Cherusci. On the outskirts of this forest, the Swabi had determined to await the arrival of the Romans. At the stage which this narrative has reached, it will not, I think, be irrelevant to describe the manners and customs of the Gauls and the Germans, and the points wherein the two peoples differ from one another. Factions exist in Gaul, not only among all the tribes, and in all the smaller communities and subdivisions, but, one may almost say, in separate households. The leaders of the rival factions are those who are popularly regarded as possessing the greatest influence, and accordingly, to their arbitrament and judgment belongs the final decision of all questions and political schemes. This custom seems to have been established at a remote period, in order that none of the common people might lack protection against the strong, for the rival leaders will not suffer their followers to be oppressed or overreached. Otherwise, they do not command their respect. The same principle holds good in Gaul, regarding, in its entirety, the tribes as a whole being divided into two groups. When Caesar arrived in Gaul, one faction was headed by the Aedui, the other by the Sequani. The latter, being in themselves the weaker, for the supremacy had from time immemorial been vested in the Aedui, who possessed extensive dependencies, had secured the alliance of the Germans under Ariovistus, gaining their adhesion by lavish expenditure and promises. As a result of several victories, in which all the Aeduans of rank were killed, they had far outstripped their rivals in power, and annexing a large proportion of their dependencies, taking the sons of their leading men as hostages, making the authorities swear to form no designs hostile to the Sequani, seizing and occupying a part of their territory near the common frontier, and establishing supremacy over the whole of Gaul. Yielding to the inevitable, Diviciacus had undertaken a journey to Rome to solicit aid from the Senate, but had returned unsuccessful. On the arrival of Caesar, the situation was completely changed. The Aedui recovered their hostages, regained power over their former dependents, and gained new ones through the influence of Caesar. For the tribes who had allied themselves to them found that they were better off and more equitably treated than before while in other respects their influence and prestige were increased. The Sequani, on the other hand, had lost their supremacy. Their place was taken by the Remi, and, as it was known that they stood as high in Caesar's favor as the Aedui, the tribes, who could not have be induced on account of old feuds to join the latter, ranged themselves among the dependents of the Remi. The Remi took care to protect them, and thus secured the new authority which they had suddenly acquired. The situation at that time was this. The Aedui ranked far the highest in general estimation, while the Remi stood next to them in importance. Everywhere in Gaul two classes only are of any account or enjoy any distinction, for the masses are regarded almost as slaves, never venture to act on their own initiative, and are not admitted to any council. Generally, when crushed by debt or heavy taxation or ill-treated by powerful individuals, they bind themselves to serve men of rank, who exercise over them all the rights that masters have over their slaves. One of the two classes consists of the Druids, the other of the Knights. The former officiate at the worship of the gods, regulate sacrifices, private as well as public, and expound questions of religion. Young men resort to them in large numbers for study and the people hold them in great respect. 
they are judges in nearly all disputes, whether between tribes or individuals. And when a crime is committed, when a murder takes place, when a dispute arises about inherited property or boundaries, they settle the matter and fix the awards and fines. If any litigant, whether an individual or a tribe, does not abide by their decision, they excommunicate the offender, the heaviest punishment which they can inflict. Persons who are under such a sentence are looked upon as impious monsters. Everybody avoids them. Everybody shuns their approach in conversation for fear of incurring pollution. If they appear as plaintiffs, they are denied justice, nor have they any share in the offices of state. The Druids are all under one head, who commands the highest respect among the order. On his death, if any of the rest is of higher standing than his fellows, he takes the vacant place. If there are several on an equality, the question of supremacy is decided by the votes of the Druids, and sometimes actually by force of arms. The Druids hold an annual session on a settled date at a hallowed spot in the country of the Carnutes, the reputed center of Gaul. All litigants assemble here from all parts and abide by their decisions and awards. Their doctrine is believed to have been found existing in Britain, and thence to have been imported into Gaul, and nowadays most people who wish to acquire a thorough knowledge of it go there to study. The Druids, as a rule, take no part in war, and do not pay taxes conjointly with other people. They enjoy exemption from military service, and immunity from all burdens. Attracted by these great privileges, many persons voluntarily come to learn from them, while many are sent by their parents and relatives. During their novitiate, it is said that they learn by heart a great number of verses, and accordingly some remain twenty years in a state of pupillage. It is against the principles of the Druids to commit their doctrines to writing, though for most other purposes, such as private and public documents, they use Greek characters. Their motive, I take it, is twofold. They are unwilling to allow their doctrine to become common property, or their disciples to trust documents and neglect to cultivate their memories. For most people find that if they rely upon documents, they become less diligent in study, and their memory is weakened. The doctrine which they are most earnest in inculcating is that the soul does not perish, but that after death it passes from one body to another. This belief they regard as a powerful incentive to valor, as it inspires a contempt for death. They also hold long discussions about the heavenly bodies and their motions, the size of the universe and of the earth, the origin of all things, the power of the gods and the limits of their dominion, and instruct their young scholars accordingly. The second of the two classes consists of the knights. On occasion, when war breaks out, as happened almost every year before Caesar's arrival, the knights, either attacking or repelling attack, they all take the field and surround themselves with as many armed servants and retainers as their birth and resources permit. This is the only mark of influence and power which they recognize. The Gallic people, in general, are remarkably addicted to religious observances, and for this reason persons suffering from serious maladies, and those whose lives are passed in battle and danger, offer or vow to offer human sacrifices and employ druids to perform the sacrificial rites, for they believe that unless, for man's life, the life of man be duly offered, the divine spirit cannot be propitiated. They also hold regular state sacrifices of the same kind. They have, besides, colossal images, the limbs of which, made of wicker work, are filled with living men and set on fire, and the victims perish, encompassed by the flames. They regard it as more acceptable to the gods to punish those who are caught in the commission of theft, robbery, or any other crime, but in default of criminals they actually resort to the sacrifice of the innocent. The god whom they most reverence is Mercury, whose images abound. He is regarded as the inventor of all arts, and the pioneer and guide of travelers. He is believed to be all-powerful in promoting commerce, and the acquisition of wealth. Next to him they reverence Apollo, Mars, Jupiter, and Minerva. Their notions about these deities are much the same as those of other peoples. Apollo they regard as the dispeller of disease, Minerva as the originator of industries and handicrafts, Jupiter as the suzerain of the celestials, and Mars as the lord of war. To Mars, when they have resolved upon battle, 
they commonly dedicate the spoils. After victory, they sacrifice the captured cattle and collect the rest of the booty in one spot. In the territories of many tribes are to be seen heaps of such spoils, reared on consecrated ground, and it has rarely happened that anyone dared, despite religion, either to conceal what he had captured or to remove what had been consecrated. For such an offense the law prescribes the heaviest punishment with torture. The Gauls universally describe themselves as descendants of Dispater, affirming that this is the Druidical tradition. For this reason they measure all periods of time, not by days, but by nights, and reckon birthdays, the first of the month and the first of the year, on the principle that the day comes after the night. As regards other customs of daily life, about the only point in which they differ from the rest of mankind is this. They do not allow their children to come near them openly until they are old enough for military service, and they regard it as unbecoming for a son, while he is still a boy, to appear in public where his father can see him. It is the custom for married men to take from their own property an amount equivalent, according to valuation, to the sum which they have received from their wives as dowry, and to lump the two together. The whole property is jointly administered, and the interest saved, and the joint shares of husband and wife, with the interest of past years, go to the survivor. Husbands have power of life and death over their wives, as well as their children. On the death of the head of a family of high birth, his relations assemble, and, if his death gives rise to suspicion, examine his wives under torture, like slaves, and if their guilt is proved, burn them to death with all kinds of tortures. Funerals, considering the Gallic standard of living, are splendid and costly. Everything, even including animals, which the departed are supposed to have cared for when they were alive, is consigned to the flames. And shortly before our time, slaves and retainers, who were known to have been beloved by their masters, were burned along with them after the conclusion of the regular obsequies. The tribes, which are regarded as comparatively well-governed, have a legal enactment to the effect that if any one hears any political rumor or intelligence from the neighboring peoples, he is to inform the magistrate and not communicate it to anyone else, as experience has proved that headstrong persons who know nothing of affairs are often alarmed by false reports and impelled to commit crimes and embark on momentous enterprises. The magistrates suppress what appears to demand secrecy and publish what they deem it expedient for the people to know. The discussion of politics, except in a formal assembly, is forbidden. The manners and customs of the Germans differ widely from those just described. They have no druids to preside over public worship, and care nothing for sacrifices. The only deities whom they recognize are those whom they can see, and from whose power they derive manifest benefit, namely sun, moon, and fire. The rest they have not even heard of. Their lives are passed entirely in hunting and warlike pursuits, and from infancy they are inured to toil and hardship. Those who preserve their virginity longest are the most respected by their fellows, for it is considered that by such continence stature and strength are developed and nerve invigorated. Indeed, to have connection with a woman before her twentieth year is thought most disgraceful. Concealment is impossible, as they bathe promiscuously in rivers, and wear only hides or small cloaks of reindeer skin, leaving a large part of the body bare. The Germans are not an agricultural people, and live principally upon milk, cheese, and meat. Nobody possesses any landed estate or private demensna. The authorities and chieftains annually assign to the several clans and groups of kinsmen assembled at the time as much land as they think proper, in whatever quarter they please, and in the following year compel them to remove to another place. Many reasons are assigned for this custom, that men may not become slaves of habit, lose their zest for war, and take to agriculture instead, that the strong may not aim at the acquisition of large estates and dispossess those of low degree, that they may not build with elaboration, to avoid heat and cold, to prevent the growth of avarice, which gives birth to party spirit and dissension, and to keep the masses contented and therefore quiet by letting everyone see that he is as well off as the most powerful. 
The greatest distinction which a tribe can have is to be surrounded by as wide a belt as possible of waste and desert land. They regard it as a tribute to their valor that the neighboring peoples should be dispossessed and retreat, and that no one should venture to settle in their vicinity. At the same time, they count on gaining additional security by being relieved from the fear of sudden attacks. When a tribe has to repel or to make an attack, officers are chosen to conduct the campaign and invested with powers of life and death. In time of peace, there is no central magistracy. The chiefs of the various districts and hundreds administer justice and settle disputes among their own people. No discredit attaches to predatory expeditions outside the tribal boundary, and the people tell you that they are undertaken in order to keep the young men in training and to prevent laziness. Whenever any of the chiefs announces his intentions in the assembly of leading an expedition and calls for volunteers, those who approve the enterprise and the leader stand up and promise to help, and the whole gathering applaud them. Those who do not follow their leader are counted as deserters and traitors, and thenceforth they are no longer trusted. To ill-treat a guest is regarded as a crime. Those who visit them, from whatever motive, they shield from injury, and regard their persons as sacred. Every man's house is open to them, and they are welcomed at meals. Once there was a time when Gauls were more warlike than Germans, actually invading their country and, on account of their dense population and insufficient territory, sending colonies across the Rhine. Thus the Volci Tectusages occupied the most fertile regions of Germany round the Hyrcanian forest, which I find was known by name to Aristosthenes and other Greeks, who called it Orcania, and there settled. To this day the people in question, who enjoy the highest reputation for fair dealing and warlike powers, continue to occupy this territory. The Germans still live the same life of poverty, privation, and patient endurance as before, and their food and physical training are the same. While the Gauls, from the proximity of the provinces and familiarity with seaborne products, are abundantly supplied with luxuries and articles of daily consumption, habituated little by little to defeat, and beaten in numerous combats, they do not even pretend themselves to be as brave as their neighbors. The Hyrcanian forest, above mentioned, extends over an area which a man traveling without encumbrance requires nine days to traverse. There is no other way of defining its extent, and the natives have no standards of measurement. Starting from the frontiers of the Helvetii, Nemetes, and Raukari, it extends right along the line of the Danube to the frontiers of the Dacians and Anartes. Then, bending to the left and passing through a country remote from the river, it borders, so vast is its extent, upon the territories of many peoples, and no one in western Germany can say that he has got to the end of the forest, even after traveling right on for sixty days, or has heard whereabouts it begins. It is known to produce many kinds of wild animals, which have never been seen elsewhere. The following, on account of their strongly marked characteristics, seemed worthy of mention. There is a species of ox, shaped like a stag, with a single horn standing out between its ears from the middle of its forehead, higher and straighter than horns as we know them. Tines spread out wide from the top, like hands and branches. The characteristics of the male and female are identical, and so are the shape and size of their horns. Again, there are elks, so-called, which resemble goats in shape, and in having piebald coats, but are rather larger. They have blunt horns, and their legs have no knots or joints. They do not lie down to sleep, and if by any chance they are knocked down, they cannot stand up again, or even raise themselves. Their resting places are trees, against which they lean, and thus rest in a partially recumbent position. Hunters mark their usual lair from their tracks, and uproot or cut deep into all trees in the neighborhood, so that they just look as if they were standing. The animals lean against them as usual, upset the weakened trunks by their mere weight, and fall down along with them. There is a third species called aurochs, a little smaller than elephants, having the appearance, color, and shape of bulls. 
They are very strong and swift, and attack every man and beast they catch sight of. The natives sedulously trap them in pits and kill them. Young men engage in the sport, hardening their muscles by the exercise, and those who kill the largest head of game exhibit the horns as a trophy, and thereby gain high honor. These animals, even when caught young, cannot be domesticated and tamed. Their horns, in size, shape, and appearance, differ widely from those of our oxen. The natives, who are fond of collecting them, mount them round the rim with silver, and use them as drinking cups at grand banquets. End of Book 6, Chapters 9-28